First of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, we are grateful every time you show up and you say to yourself, wow, he's thanking me for coming to church. Didn't I do that for God? Yes, you did. But we work hard to provide an opportunity for you to express in a congregational manner what you would like to God. So we hope that the songs that you've just sung, uh, I liked that one from the chorale, that uh, thank you for all those who put work into doing that. Thank you very, very much. It, uh, it reminds me of uh, singing with a group in college. Some of us uh, did that, and it's always fun to remember. Um, I'm grateful every Sabbath for the music that comes forward from the various groups in this church. And uh, if you uh, are, are feeling like I am, then I think that you know coming and being here on a Sabbath morning does what it is intended to do, and that is to encourage you. So how was your week? Was it good? Was it bad? Great. Great? Fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. Those of you who are grumbling saying, it was terrible, I didn't get enough sleep. You know, you're not wanting me to hear that, but I'm wanting you to know that I prayed for you just a moment ago. And that's what we get to do when we come together. We, we get to pray and we get to thank God for the way that he has led us despite the fact that negative things happened. And those may be negative things from our perspective, but they may actually be the leading of God. We don't know. So when we compare that with scripture, when we talk with individuals as we come to church, we have the opportunity then to see the hand of God leading in our lives. So uh, we're into a new series uh, that is uh, hopefully going to be something that will entice you into, uh, how shall I say, following God into his, his vineyard. And we're, we're calling it missional living. Now you think, oh my goodness, what is, this, what is this new word, missional? Well, we dealt with that a little bit last week. I would invite you, if you want the whole enchilada, to go online to our website and you can, you can pick up what we said last week. But I'll, I'll just start by saying that we did talk about what the word missional and what the word incarnational means. And I did say that those who speak Spanish have the advantage here because they order chili con carne. Okay? And it does. It means flesh. And it means enfleshment. And we learned last week that, that incarnation is simply the, the methodology, the strategy that God chose to use to communicate with his creatures. Some of you may have been shocked. So I'll shock the rest of you now by saying that I believe that God has done this more than once. How many of you uh, answered the question correctly last week? Uh, if Lucifer was a guardian angel, he, he was a covering cherub at one time in his career, who was on the other side while Lucifer was on, on the side? There was another angel. There were two angels covering the throne of God at the same time. And at one time, Lucifer was one of those angels. What was the name of the other one? No. You don't get it. You, you, you get zero for that. Michael. Michael, the archangel. Who do we find out does battle later on with Lucifer and ends up kicking him out of heaven with a third of the heavenly host? Michael, what else happened to Michael? He was drawn into the counsel of God when the earth was made. So who is Michael? I want you to know that the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches that Michael the archangel is the same as Jesus the Christ. So do you see why I am saying that I believe, based on this understanding that we teach but maybe have not connected before, God has a way of communicating with his creatures. The creator wants to communicate with his creatures and his methodology, his strategy is to do it through incarnation, enfleshment. So for the angels, we know that he was an angel. 
His name was Michael. Now we heard about the, 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 the huge uh, hurricane that came recently. Uh, I am named Michael. Okay, this, this is a, a, a popular name, it seems. Uh, although I think the hurricane agency just names things in alphabetical order, which means that we're at M in the hurricane season. And they decided to use the name Michael this time. Uh, I wish they hadn't, but, you know, because he did a lot of damage. And, uh, and there's still going to be, uh, well, there will be a lot of people in this uh, country of ours who will never, ever have the same life because of that event. Uh, I did have the privilege of serving in the cleanup from the Waveland in, uh, incident when Waveland was literally taken off the map of Mississippi. Houses were left with just their foundations. And this is the kind of damage that we see in the, uh, on the coast again this time. And it, it's, it's crazy. We will bounce back, but it, we, we will not bounce back the same. So uh, that, that's just free information for you. But I just wanted you to know that God has a habit. He has a strategy. He has a, a way in which he does his communicating with his creatures and he does so with incarnation. And he does so with a purpose, and that purpose is the mission that he has. So that is why we're calling this next few weeks that we're together, we're calling this uh, a missional life or missional living a guide to incarnational living. Okay, so the invitation is even in that to follow his way of doing the mission that he has sent us on now that he has gone back to the Father. He has said, you will be my witnesses. You will go on the same mission that I've gone on. And maybe we have asked ourselves the question, well, how are we supposed to do that? Well, hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll, we'll answer that a little bit more. Go with me to Acts chapter 3, if you will. Acts chapter 3 contains a story that comes, of course, after Acts chapter 2. What is famous, class, what is famous about Acts chapter 2? Peter is on stage again, is he not? This time he's a very different person than he was when he was outside of the place where they were trying Jesus in that kangaroo court with trumped up charges. Peter was outside and he was talking with the other people that were uh, uh, in the middle of the night warming themselves around a fire and they were saying, oh, you're one of those Galileans. Are you one of his disciples? And he was cursing and swearing and trying to prove that he was not an associate of Jesus because he was thinking, if I'm too close to Jesus, I just might end up like him. You're right, Eric. Pentecost happened, my friends, and so because of this infill... Well, what happened at Pentecost? Do you remember? Tongues of fire, this, this supernatural event. They're in a room. Maybe it's a, a room like this. I mean, there's a room that they say is the room. You can go on tours of Jerusalem, Christian tours of Jerusalem, and they will take you to the upper room. And it's about half the size of our congregation uh, seating today. It's open, and, and of course there is lots of Christian paraphernalia in there now because there are people who come there because they want to worship. They want to see if they get the same vibe uh, as, they, as the early church did. Well, I, I told you that I was really glad you were here today because I am hoping that by uh, obeying the, the message of Christ, by gathering ourselves together as he told his disciples to do, as he was lifting off from earth, as he was leaving, he says, go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. They didn't know how the Holy Spirit would come, what form it would take, what the experience would be like. But they obeyed. And I'm telling you, folks, it is, it is the, the one thing, if there's one thing that the disciples of Jesus did that I want to follow, it is to obey Jesus. 
If they had not done that, if they had said, you know, let's just go back to Galilee and fish, come on, dudes, they would have missed out on the blessing. But they decided to do what Jesus asked them to do, and as a result, the Spirit of God, they're there, they're there for a number of days, days waiting. If you're like me and you think, man, this Adventist thing, it's been going on for so long. Why do we have to wait so long? I don't know. Maybe it's the thing with God. He tests us to see if we're really into this, to see if we really want to be with him. Ten days they're there. And at the end of those ten days, there comes this rushing wind. Maybe it was a Santa Ana. I don't know. But it comes rushing in like it did yesterday afternoon. I'm sitting on my porch and it was all calm. And then suddenly, whoosh, and the, the trees start going and the leaves start shaking. And what wasn't there before is suddenly there now. And the Bible says that there was tongues of fire that fell on their heads. And I, I'm only telling you this part of the story. I hadn't really intended to, but I'm telling you this part of the story because you need to know that when you read... Acts chapter 3, it's because what happened in Acts chapter 2 happened. Because now you don't have just Peter beside a fire cursing, trying to say, oh, I don't know if I really want to be close to Jesus. You have Peter standing up in front of people from all of the Roman world at that time who were Jewish people coming in for the, the, the Feast of Pentecost. They were, they were there and, and they spoke all different kinds of languages and you have Peter standing up and saying, this is Jesus and you know what? You killed him. He's not afraid anymore. The Holy Spirit has gotten a hold of this fisherman who is rough and tough and, 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 and still, uh, uh, you know, wants to be you know, a real man. He's gotten a hold of him. That's why I say I, I don't necessarily want to be like the apostles, the, the, the disciples of Jesus before Pentecost. I want to be like the apostles after Pentecost. So yes, I, I pray that every time we come together like this on a Sabbath, that you would feel the infilling of the Holy Spirit and that you would leave and that next week would be different from last week. Because the Holy Spirit has come upon you and that the words that you speak are not your own. They are the words of the Holy Spirit that you have been inspired to speak to whomever comes across your path from wherever they are. Because Jesus said to his disciples, you will be my witnesses. So what happens? Well, let's, 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 let's see what happens. If we're talking about the missional life, what, 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 what does it look like? Well, here we go. One day, Peter, this is verse 1, one day Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer. Now, you, you, you can't just go, okay. You have to say to yourself, who is this? What are they doing? And where are they going? Because this is the setup for the story. This is the setup for the, the whole reason why this story is included by Luke in his, his second book called Acts. It's Peter and John. All that's missing is James, three best friends of Jesus, Peter, James, and John. Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer. So you have some, you have these guys who have had this experience with Jesus who came to the Jewish people because they were the chosen ones that had for centuries been given an opportunity to get to know the God of heaven through his sacrificial system. And now they had also been given the, the realization that this was indeed what John the Baptist said it, that, that he was, excuse me, that he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Ellen White tells us, those hands that tore the curtain when Jesus died, from top to bottom, those supernatural hands that tore the curtain of the temple, gave us, all humanity, direct access into the very throne room of God. Through Jesus, who is, is 
prefigured by every single symbol that is in that temple. He is also the, the door. He is the curtain. He veiled himself. Aren't we talking about incarnation? God takes on a veil. He veils himself with the human flesh of humanity. But when he dies, that human existence is torn. And now we see that he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When did this take place? I'm telling you, God is always on time. He is never late. He's never early. He's always on time. Via his time, <laughs> it's at the time of the evening sacrifice. Morning, evening. Just learn from that, moms and dads, uncles and aunties, grandmas and grandpas. It's good to have morning and evening worship. It was something that God gave Adam and Eve. It was something that he gave again to his people in the desert. There was morning and evening prayers, morning and evening sacrifice, so that you would remember it's not you who takes away your own sins. It is the Lamb of God. So there were lamb sacrifices. I know. Some of you are licking your chops already thinking of lamb chops. I know. Okay. And, and that's, <laughs> that's, a, that, that, that's fortunate and unfortunate depending on how you feel about lamb. But for the lamb, it was not, it was not good. The lamb died. But it was all as a way of teaching. For this very moment when the lamb would be slain. So where do we find after this event? Where do we find Peter and John? Peter and John were on their way to pray. What is another name for Jesus? I know that I call him the plan. But there is another older name for him. He's called the way. In fact, before Christians were called Christians for the first time in Antioch, they were called followers of the, the way. So here you have, uh, even in the way that Luke writes this, Peter and John were on their way. My friends, this describes for me in, in sort of one simple sentence what the Christian life should be like. If you've accepted Jesus into your life as your leader and your guide and your, your, your savior, then you're saying, Lord, how do I live now? And he says, look, you're going to just be, you're going to be on the way and I'm going to lead you on the way. They're on the way to pray, to be in this place where, where prayer and praise, communication with their God would happen. To me, again, this describes sort of the attitude that we should have in our lives today, that we're on the way. We're in this not just one day a week. I don't, I don't think we should be called seventh, even though it's our name, seventh day. How about seven? Seven day, as in like 24 seven day. Adventists. Every day we can be on, on the way, on the way to pray. So it's in this context where they're living this life now that is dedicated to Jesus, that is led by Jesus. They're on the way. They're taking advantage of the opportunities that the religious situation of their day provided them. Again, thank you very much for coming. You are taking advantage of the religious situation that has been provided you by the Seventh-day Adventist Church who provides worship services on Saturdays. We call it the Sabbath because of our scriptural and religious understanding. But you're taking advantage of it by being here. Literally, if you're not here, or if you're not here by video, you don't get it. It's, it's that simple. You either do or you don't. Peter and John said, we value the opportunity to be on the way to pray. 
to gather together with like believers in the God of creation and to pray to him and to praise him for what he is to them and, and to us. So it's in that context. That's why I say let's, let's realize that, that this is not just a quick sentence of telling us what Peter and John were doing, but it, 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 it's more about who they were, what they had decided, and what they had become as a result of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which is, I believe, I'm praying, everything that we would like as well. They meet a beggar. Now, a man crippled from birth. It's a whole other sermon there. Was being carried to the temple gate, to the gate called Beautiful. They named all their gates. I mean, you go to Jerusalem today, and some of the gates still have names like Damascus Gate. It faces Damascus. Okay. When he, the beggar, saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man, because obviously he wasn't looking at them. He was like, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, and these are, these are classic words that we're going to sing in a moment, silver and gold I do not have. Old English, have I none. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. He doesn't give him silver and gold. He gives him his legs back. Well, not back. For the first time. The first time. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Wonder and amazement because they sure hoped it would happen to them as well. The song goes like this. Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way. He held out his palms and he asked for some alms. That's the old word. And this is what Peter did say. Sing it with me if you know. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now you got to do the actions. He went walking and leaping and praising God, walking and leaping and praising God. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, we sing that song at camp. That's why I know it so well. We sing it in Sabbath school. We teach your children this song. I hope they teach you. Because it's fun. Because it's amazing. And this is what happened on that particular day as Peter and John were walking into the temple. Silver and gold I do not have. I will not be able, Peter is saying, I will not be able to fulfill your expectations in this situation. And that word situation is so important to realize because you see, that man was begging. That man was begging because he had been taught to beg. He had been crippled from birth and the lot of beggars was to sit and beg because you were crippled. The lot of cripples was to sit and beg. This was, your, this was going to be your life. This was going to be your lot in life. In their society, it was, 
Uh, something that is still in our society today, and if you look at many foundations, they have uh, uh, Jewish Israelite people who have started these foundations because in that religion it is looked upon as a good thing that righteous people do to donate. I think we could. I, I, I think we could copy that. I think it's a good thing. God smiles upon those who share. Agreed? So this is part of who they are, and he is participating in this situation, and he just throws up one hand, thinking, here go two good-looking guys who probably have some money. They're going in to pray, and if they want to be right with God when they get there, they'll give me something. And you could say, oh my goodness, he was so taking advantage of them. Yes, he was. That's why he wasn't even looking. In his situation, he had been told, this is what you do. That he's being carried, the Bible says, he's being carried to his spot, his corner. And he was doing what he was told to do by his parents. He was raising money for his situation. And the, and the society was joining in. They were dropping their coins at his feet saying, you know what, God told us we should take care of the widows and orphans and the cripples. So here you go. I'm now good in God's eyes. You see? I'm not going to give you what you want, Peter says. I'm going to give you what I have. <coughs> Silver and gold, I don't have. I, I, I'm not blessed. How shall I say? That's maybe a wrong word. I, I, I'm not, or no longer am I participating in this idea that society has that because I am happy and joyous and I'm on the way, that therefore I am going to have lots of money. That's all what that phrase <laughs> Silver and gold have I none. Silver and gold is what everyone else is after. Silver and gold is what everybody else thinks people who are blessed by God have silver and gold. Peter says, you know what? That's not how it works. That's not how it works. The blessings of God come in multiple different ways. And in fact, in this very instance, you are going to receive the blessings of God because I asked him to heal your legs. Is that going to be better than silver and gold? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's going to change his life. He's now going to be able to go out and earn his own silver and gold. He's going to be, what did Pinocchio say? A real boy. Not going to be able to fulfill your expectations. But I'm going to give you what I have. My friends, this presupposes, this presupposes that Peter and John have something to give. I don't know about you, but... but I want to make sure that as I am on the way, that I have that Holy Spirit power, that I actually have something to give that's not silver and gold. That's the power of God. I mean, when we bless the offering every Sabbath, do you know why we're blessing it? We're giving it to God and we're saying, God, use your power with, with these gifts that we have to do whatever you want them to do. Guess what? We need to be praying the same prayer about us. Like the little kid who didn't have any, any offering one day and, and, and the offering plate came past on the pews like they used to pass it along and the kid jumped into the offering plate. <laughs> Silver and gold have I none. But such as I am, I give. And Jesus says, I'll take that. And I'll heal, I'll heal this beggar. Maybe this week the words that you're going to say are going to be 
words from heaven that will heal someone else's heart. You ever thought about that? It's not silver and gold. It might be what you say to your coworker this week. I don't know. Maybe you're their boss and you have to fire them. Maybe how you fire them matters. So that when they come away, they feel somehow that it's okay that they got fired. Because you love them so much. I don't know what it's, I don't know what it's going to be. But he says, I cannot fulfill you, your expectations in this situation. I am going to give you what I have. And what I have comes from outside, comes from outside of this situation. Because you see, Jesus came from outside and he incarnated into our situation. And that is what Peter had and what he was willing to give away. And so he said, in the name of Jesus, of Nazareth, he identifies the leader. He identifies the power source. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So the question really today that that we're asking in this journey that we're taking of missional living is, what's, what's your gospel? You know the phrase comes on the ad, what's in your wallet? Well, I want to ask you this morning, what's... What's your gospel? What's, what's your good news? This is the, the text that, that has been read so expertly for us and also came in our children's story today. Turn back to Luke chapter 4, real quick. Luke chapter 4. Jesus has come to his boyhood home. It was also where he was a teenager. It was also where he was a young adult. It was where he left from when he said to his mother, it's now time, mom. He's 30 years old. It's now time that I go and do what you know that I'm going to do. So he's well known. In fact, I, I, I've written into, into my Bible, Josephson. Josephson. Somebody asked in a recent meeting that we have, what is Jesus' real name? Well, the people of Nazareth knew him as Jesus Josephson. Jesus, the son of Joseph. And and, and this passage tells us that that is how they they knew him. He's come back, and it's it's the weekend, and, and he's taking a break from his ministry. He comes back to Nazareth, and it's Sabbath. Now, I I cannot pass this up in verse 16. As was his custom. You want to know how Jesus lived his life? Hectic in his ministry. His custom was to take a break on Saturday, the Sabbath, and go to church. Or, in his case, synagogue. You want a synagogue-type experience? Come at 930 to this church, and you can have a lesson study. Thanks, Diane, for teaching the adult lesson study today. Thanks to all the teachers who taught your kids today. That's what we call Sabbath school. It's very similar to the synagogue-like environment that Jesus would have had opportunity to go to. And so he goes to his synagogue, and he is given a, a, a real privilege The privilege is that you get to not only hold the scroll, which is sacred writ, he gets to unroll it and read it. Still to this day, there are festivals about the Torah. I happen to be in one in the big synagogue, the great synagogue of Jerusalem. Simcha Torah. This is when they take down the scrolls and they, they, they have the privilege, those that, that are privileged to actually hold the scrolls, and they gently dance around the synagogue. This is not one of those days, but it's still a privilege. Jesus is given that privilege to read 
the scripture and to choose which scripture to read. This is all, this is all very special. I want you to know from a Jewish perspective. Sorry. I'm being a, I, I get into my Jewish mother mode. But this is very special. He chooses Isaiah. Or as I say, Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to, for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's reading Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. Then he rolled up the scroll, probably, probably vellum, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And as the story was told to you this morning, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And then he began by saying to them, because you see, this is what would happen. You would read, and then you would give an interpretation. All he says to begin with is this. Today, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I ask you today, what is your gospel? What is your good news that you're going to leave here today and say, God has told me that I need to tell someone else this good news. That's your homework. We're going to have homework in these next few weeks. If you don't have uh, this firmly established in your heart that this is what you are supposed to be telling your friends and your co-workers and your loved ones, then maybe this is the week that you seriously get with Jesus and say, Jesus, I need, I need to know. What do you want me to be saying to my world? You're my leader. You died for me. You saved me. I owe you my life. And therefore, I am asking you, please tell me what I am supposed to say and what I'm supposed to do. Please. And I, I, I want to say I have it on good authority, the authority of the Holy Spirit, that when you pray that prayer, he will answer and he will let you know what your good news is. What is the good news that he wants you to share? This is the good news that Jesus came to share with all humanity. Uh, and this is how he goes about that piece of it. And, and, and you're going to see in a moment what happens when he basically makes the inference, watch for the inference here, that this is not just a gospel for the people that he's reading to. This is a gospel for the whole world. He starts by poking, poking. Do you know that Jesus pokes those he loves? <laughs> he does. Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal thyself. What is he saying? You see, Jesus had already done miracles. Jesus had already healed people. And now here he's coming back to his hometown and they are fully expecting that he is going to do some kind of miracle just like that in his hometown. So he's, he, he just, he's, he's just bold-faced, comes up to them and says, for sure you're going to say, physician, heal thyself. In other words, do something to show us that you are the great physician. Do here in your hometown, he says, what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have video. They didn't have anything but verbal reports. And it had been reported to them that he'd been healing people in Capernaum. Hey, Jesus. Hey, you did it for them. Why don't you do it for us? I tell you the truth, he continued. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. What? They didn't think he was going there. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. Oh my goodness, why is he bringing up that story? When the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of the widows in Israel. 
but to the widow of Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Their minds are spinning at this moment and they're going, what is he saying? Is he saying what I think he's saying? Is he saying that we're not good enough? Is he saying that, that we're not going to treat him with respect? Is he saying we don't understand, that we don't know him? Is that what he's saying? These are the good church people, and they're in church when they're saying this. And there were many in Israel, he goes on, with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. What? What is he saying? Well, they knew what he was saying. He was saying, you know what? You were special, but you didn't take advantage of your specialness. Now I'm saying that everybody in the world is special to God, and you're going to get upset about that? Well, look what they did. All the people in the synagogue were furious, not just some of them, all of them. All of them were furious when they heard this. They got up and they drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built. And yes, my friends, you go up to Jerusalem and you go up to Nazareth. It is built on a series of seven hills in the Galilee area. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Was this a display of his supernatural powers that he could walk through a very angry crowd that had just been dissed by him for not understanding what the scroll of Isaiah was saying? You had a job to do, Israel. You didn't do it. So I went elsewhere to find people who would do what I asked them to do. What? No, you can't do that, Jesus. You're in trouble with us. We're going to take you and we're going to get rid of you. Even though we know you as Jesus Josephson, even though you grew up right here in the midst of us, you better leave. You better go. I have news if you intend to invite the Holy Spirit into your life, if you intend to walk along the way, if you intend to share the gospel that God puts in your heart, the good news of salvation, it may not always be well received. And maybe especially by those who are closest to you, who have some other idea of who you are. Maybe you're going to have to convince them I'm a different person now because Jesus is in control of my life. Maybe the way that you live is going to have to have some time in front of these people before they will know, before they will know without a shadow of a doubt that you are a follower of the one true living God. It's going to take some time, maybe. But you're going to have to give that message again and again. You're going to have to give it consistently. I, I love you because Jesus has sent me to you. He loves you and he wants you to know his good news and he's asked me to tell you. Your, your homework, if you so choose, is now twofold. One is, uh, one is look for uh, opportunities to go across whatever fences exist in your life. Add to that part B. I want you to look this week for what God is doing in the world today. And I didn't say what the Adventist church is doing, although I believe the Adventist church is helping God. I want you to pray this week, maybe something you've never prayed before. Please, God, open my eyes so that I can see what you're doing in Santa Clarita, California, or wherever you are this week. 
Understand that God is interested in working with anybody. Even me. Even you. And if that is true, then he may be using a lot of people in Santa Clarita to do his work. Are we taking notice? When we ask the question, how shall we live? We need to be aware of how our God is working in Santa Clarita. So that we can know how to get involved. And that's kind of part C of the situation. Not only ask God what mission, what gospel he would like you to do, but also let's look for, let's look for where he has already tasked individuals and or situations to be doing his will. And if you have the time, I'm inviting you to take the time, go check it out. Go join. I personally got excited when I came to this church and I saw that we were involved with Family Promise. Family Promise is a nonprofit organization that houses homeless children in Santa Clarita. I said to myself, you know what? The gospel of Jesus says we should be interested in people who are homeless. That's my belief. So when I came to this congregation, I thought, wow, this is cool. This congregation is involved with an organization in the here and now that is interested in helping to find homes for homeless children and their families. And so it has been that we have become, you know, deeply involved more with family promise. But I'm going to guess that every single one of you sitting in this pew knows of something that is going on, maybe not even religious, in this town right now, that you could say, you know what, whoever started that is listening to Jesus. Do you, do you, think, do you think that the, the, the services that this town provides for us are there because uh, somebody thought that they would be just a good idea? Or do you think that this, the, this town provides uh, uh, police, provides fire, provides uh, EMTs, provides a hospital, provides... Do you think that that was because somebody thought it was just a good idea or because somebody knew that God wanted us to take care of each other? See? So where you can look into your surroundings and, and see God at work, that's your homework this week. Next week I may ask a few of you to share to see whether or not you did your homework. So I don't know if that's going to keep you from coming back. I hope it doesn't. But, but I think that Sabbath should be a, a time when we celebrate what God is doing in our own lives personally and also what he is doing in our community. If you believe that, say amen. amen. All right. So, okay, I know that, you know, people don't like to come where there are teachers. So I'll, I'll be quiet now. Uh, but you have your homework. Yeah? And, 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 and I'll, I'll see you again next week. And we'll praise God for what he has opened our eyes to in this very community that he is doing. Because that is what the people of Nazareth didn't do. They had God himself in their midst, and they wouldn't believe it. I don't want to be that way. I don't want to be that, that kind of people, to have God in our midst and to not believe that what he is up to is real. I want to see it, and I want to celebrate it, and I want to say, thank you, Jesus. Amen.